Hello, friends and fellow adventurers. <laughs> Welcome to MinMaxed Presents Masters, monthly awesome session to eviscerate rules shit. This video presentation stream thingy is going to be all about differences in rules between Pathfinder 1st Edition and Pathfinder 2nd Edition. If you're watching this, you almost certainly know what that is. However, if you're watching this, you may or may not know who we are. We are MinMaxed, an actual play Pathfinder 2nd Edition podcast. We launched to coincide with the release of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, dropping our first two episodes the day after the game became available. We are all of us long-time Pathfinder 1st Edition players, as well as 3rd and 3.5 before it, and all manner of other systems. Along with presenting entertaining adventures, we want to be TTRPG ambassadors, and hopefully also help teach a little bit about this system we love, Pathfinder 2E. A little bit along the way. One of the biggest things we run into playing this game is assumptions we're bringing from 1st edition and other things into 2nd edition. So after almost two years of this game being out, we've come up with a list of things that are somewhat less than obvious differences between the systems, and we want to share them with you. Maybe you're wondering if you want to make the jump from 1E to 2E, maybe you love 2E and want to hear people talk about it. Maybe you were trying to get to porn and ended up here, we don't don't care, we're just glad you came. Uh, anyway, let's start with some introductions. Tyler! <laughs> you know, you said you were going to do it, and as soon as you started doing it, I was like, oh, yep, yep, he's definitely doing it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Tyler. I am the game master for the main show for the MinMax podcast. Uh, we do, I do the Fall of Plaguestone game, the Extinction Curse game, the as-of-yet-unannounced patron goal game and uh yeah uh, i'm really excited for tonight because i haven't really had an in-depth discussion with people in the open about those little tiny differences between first edition and second edition so i'm super excited for this go ahead swanee me next oh, okay i am swanee i am affectionately affectionately known as the rules lawyer around here uh Air quotes there, affectionately. Uh, <laughs> I'm the one that makes sure that this podcast uh, doesn't go way off the rails. That's my job here. I make sure that uh, we uh, get to do the rules as you guys seem to enjoy, which I'm very happy about. I'm glad I'm not the only one out there. So I've uh, been playing D&D and Pathfinder for 18 years now, so... It's really funny, and we just had the opportunity to really look at that recently. We're going to do an, uh, an, an interview with another pod here, and you look back at that, and you go, wow, I've been doing this for a while. It's fun. But that's not, we're not here to talk about that, though, <laughs> right? We're I, here to talk about... Well, I didn't stuff. introduce myself yet. Hold on. Oh, obviously. Oh, I mean, sorry, I got to sorry. do all the talking at the beginning, but... Uh, that's true, you did. Anyway, we'll make it quick. <laughs> I'm David. I've been playing for, like, 20 years. It's ridiculous. I'm fucking old. Uh, also, this is not a show for children, so they can go the fuck bed. Uh, anyway, yeah. we... Uh, uh, Swanee and I have been friends for a very long time. Tyler and I have been friends for only a little over a decade. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we just love playing this game together. There are three other members of this podcast who are not here, so we should mention them really quick. Ted, of course, Benzi, and Spencer. Oh, and by the way, I do like the editing and the production and stuff, so if you hear somebody yelling at you on a MinMax podcast, it's probably me. It's certainly you. So, next, we want to start off, we've got a document that we've been working on called MinMax Shits That's Different. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll make that available to everybody. It is a place where you can go to look at some things that we've come up with less than obvious. Everybody knows the obvious stuff, like there's three actions that you can use in Pathfinder 2nd Edition rather than whatever you would call it back in other editions. That's obvious. We're going to go a little bit less obvious kinds of things. We're going to start with uh, different things that are specifically things that each of us individually think are great or very interesting. And we'll start with Swanee. Yeah, uh, I love casters. I've always loved casters. So this is a little on the more obvious side, but I'm going with cantrips because it is such a huge change from the prior session or prior versions. Um, I mean, before cantrips, after level two or three, you know, they're basically worthless. And now with their ability to heighten, 
they they're so much better. So now most almost every cantrip has uh, at least every damaging cantrip has like a heightened plus one. Uh, this means every level it gets a little bit stronger. Uh, I think an array of frost starts out you know dealing one d four plus caster mod, and then at level two, well second level spells. Uh, yeah, it's another 1d4. Third level spells, yet another 1d4. So they keep getting stronger as you get stronger so that they're no longer worthless. Uh, because of before, you know, you'd get to a couple levels in and all of a sudden that 1d4 damage you're doing is just not even worth it. But it's all you can do when you run out of spells. Now you've got a way to keep doing that stuff. Um, a couple other... The non-damaging ones might move out of... Uh, the plus one and be like, you know, at third level, it heightens that you get a, another certain effect. Uh, thinking uh, detect magic at third level, you can detect more stuff. At fifth level, you can detect more pinpointed stuff. And they just keep getting better and better. It's funny the way that the uh, detect magic one, we first realized that that was so different. We're like, wait, we can't just find it right away. Okay, we'll grab everything that we think is magical, throw it out. Detect magic again. Uh, that was fun. Uh, the other thing I like about the cantrip bit is it actually makes when you take either through ancestries or you know dips into uh, dedication feats that offer cantrips, uh, those cantrips scale with character level, not necessarily with you know the caster level of your spellcasting class. So that cantrip that scales up and up as you become a more powerful character doesn't just stop no matter where you get it from true yeah, and it always heightens to half your level rounded up so yep. there there are some cantrips i mean for counter spell purposes and stuff like that those spells are technically stronger spells yeah, and actually mordine in our live chat is uh pointing out that it also means you can't technically be out of spells uh i do recall back in the day, all the way up until second edition, and when the wizard or the caster was low level and you ran out of spells, you better have a crossbow with you. Yep. Otherwise, you're useless. Yeah, low level casters had a lot of weaknesses. The biggest one being you couldn't dungeon dive with them because you'd be out of spells in no time. Yeah, that you is had, resolved. You had, you had three spells, and then you were yeah. just a, a squishy commoner standing around. <laughs> also, Jay Pickle can trip more like can rip. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I do like that. Uh, by the way, for anybody who's watching this after the fact, our live streamers know this, obviously. Uh, but we are in our Discord live. This is where we're going to be doing these in the future. Uh, come and hang out with us. You get a lot more interaction than any other way with us that way. Um, but don't be afraid to email us either. Yeah, It's, it's just a great place if you enjoy Pathfinder 2nd Edition. There are shit tons of people in here who do. And uh, we have found mm -hmm. it to be just an excellent community. At, by no fault of, like, by nothing that we've done. It's just everybody. <laughs> everybody is fucking cool and put up with us. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Feel free absolutely. to come join the Discord. Um, Tyler. Um, you know, the one that I'm going to just talk about briefly, and I'm sure we'll get to other ones as we go along here. Um, the one that surprised me the most and actually affected one of our, our shows the most was the you aren't limited when you're grappled by somebody. The grabbed condition is what you get. You don't have to strike with only a light one-handed weapon any longer. It used to be in previous editions that when you were grappled or, you know, caught up in that whole tree that you have to be caught up in, depending on the edition that you're in, um, you couldn't do anything but, you know, do Dude, a dagger. that fucking 3-5 and Pathfinder first edition grapple flowchart. Oh, the flowchart. You had to have it at the table. <laughs> You absolutely did. Uh, I have, uh, I had this three ring binder that I had the su summary of all of the three dot five OGL rules for first edition. And it was like twenty pages, and that was a whole section of of it. But anyways, uh, in second edition, that's not really a thing as much anymore. The grappled condition, uh, it, of course, you know, imposes penalties, of course, right? Uh, but it doesn't prevent you from using a two handed greatsword to cut at the thing that's currently grappling you which is uh really interesting and took away one of my favorite parts about one of david's characters <laughs> yeah i played a character uh, that was okay. uh that was, had the alchemist dedication which is um what multi-classing is now and perhaps we'll talk about that as well uh, but again that's one of the more commonly known differences but uh 
Yeah, yeah. I, I had this whole thing where I'd take a thing called bestial mutagen, which gave me natural attacks. Turns out, didn't need them, was hampering myself, could just attack with my two-handed weapon while grappled. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, then I'll go with the one that um, that I wanted to talk about the most, and that is the new difference with reach. Now, all weapons uh, and their properties work differently uh, than they used to. Reach is one of the biggest differences. So I loved making reach characters. I would have like an orc so you could get the plus two strength, and then I would have the, uh, the, the spiked chain because it was the only reach weapon that you could also attack adjacent enemies with so you could attack enemies that were five feet away from you and 10 feet away from you then i would make it a large sized spiked chain and take the monkey grip feet which allowed you to wield oversized weapons so then you'd have like a 15 foot reach and you could get all sorts of attacks of opportunity it was a fun build i made that character like three times (laughs) you don't have to do that anymore because now reach means you can attack both 10 feet away and five feet away. So there's none of this. You can't attack adjacent enemies with a reach weapon anymore. That's gone. And it's not exactly obvious. I mean, if you read the reach property, it it tells you, but it's one of those things that you just make an assumption. You'd be looking through and see like a, like a halberd or or a spear has reach. And you'd think, well, I'm not going to use that because normally it was terrible in three, five, because you could only attack things that were 10 feet away from you. No longer. And I think that's good. I, I think it gives you more variation. I don't think it's super broken, partially because of one of the other big changes that most people know about. And that is that not every character has attack of opportunity. In fact, very few characters are going to end up having attack of opportunity. So having that 10 foot reach is it the super huge bonus that it was, which is you could attack of opportunity every single person that came into you. But if you and- play a character that does have it, you still can. And I, I recall that, like, there are moments where you use, like, I, I had entire builds when I got a chance to play, uh, or even I think some builds I never got to use, where it was working around that five foot space in between your weapon and you. And there are a few ways to do it, like you mentioned, but it's uh, that pigeonhole is only a certain combination of classes that could do it. Whereas, like you said, now anybody can. It's really nice. Yeah. It's. It's nice, and I think it, I know it's dumb to say that you like realism in your fantasy TTRPG, but (laughs) when it comes to things that really exist in the physical world, like spears, like spears are objectively better than swords. People say swords are the prince of weapons and spears are the king. So like in history, spears 100% better than swords in almost all circumstances. And to have a game like this where they were just basically worthless, that felt cheap to me. You were shorting the spear. <laughs> it was a dumb <laughs> god. I didn't yeah. ask that. <laughs> as, as far as two-handed weapons go, spears were such terrible weapons. Oh, they're garbage. It's one. garbage. You, yeah. always wanted yeah. a, you always wanted a great sword. But um, now it's, it's absolutely viable and, in fact, very good uh, to play a, a reach fighter or barbarian or whatever, anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Force them to make that five foot step towards you, enter your space and get that attack of opportunity. Yep. Yep. You know, I'm sure we could probably talk for the full hour at some point in the future about how positioning has changed the way that combat flows, both attack of opportunity being non not a common thing any longer and positioning. We've found at least for certain combats, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, right. That- positioning. As uh, Mordain is pointing out in our uh, live chat here, uh, yes, because Attack of Opportunity is so much less common now, it is fun as a game master to have a monster that has it and then surprise your players when they think they can just waltz around and then they just get smashed. So it's, it's fun. It, it is fun. It actually, it, to me, and this is the way Attack of Opportunity flavors to me, it lets them know that this is a very militaristic monster that has its shit together and it can hit you because yeah. this thing is taking just crazy. Out. This thing's calculated, right? Calculated. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. There was, uh, there was something that was, we're kind of talking about some of the comments that were made, and I don't want them all to blow by here as live. Ratha pointed out earlier uh, that one of the biggest changes uh, that, and again, we could probably go deep into spells at some point, and we will, uh, but haste 
and the quickened action allowing you to stride or strike but that doesn't necessarily count for things like flying flying is its own movement action so is swimming and climbing so your hasted action with the quickened condition does not give that additional flight like you used to be able to do yeah haste would be a haste in and of itself is a spell that you could spend quite some time just talking about the differences of maybe we will mm. at some point but uh, yeah, i think they changed a lot of spells yeah a lot of spells are different in some ways better some ways worse but i uh, like like just less effective well, i mean i don't mean they, worse had, to, they had to balance they them, had to balance which them. is really what 2e is all about but we'll probably talk about that some other time too <laughs> i'm sure we <laughs> We're will just gonna keep saying all that these things all these we things gotta get through make notes. we gotta get through this in an hour right yes yes we've got a whole <laughs> yes. list here that of things that we're gonna go through and we're gonna go to just kind of the top of the list and work our way down and we can go back to swanee to take ability points yeah ability points are another one of those big changes um and while it is pretty obvious that it's very different. Um, you know, 1E, you could do either the rolling or you could do point by. Uh, character creation in 2E is very much more structured. Your ancestry gives you some bonuses to ability points. Your background gives you some options for ability points. Your class gives you a specific ability boost. And then you have some free boosts that you get to do to whatever you want. And all of that allows you to build a character that is um, more in tune with what you want. And, I mean, one, one E, you could build it the, that same way, but it's just a different way to do it. I like the fact that you kind of are picking, like, your background. Hey, I'm a, I'm a laborer, so I have I can choose strength or constitution. Or I was a gladiator, so I could choose strength or charisma, because you could lean more into that performance side of the gladiator. And then you have a free one to do whatever you want with. It's not so restrictive as some of the the traits and stuff like that that 1E had, where it's like, you picked this, you got one thing. That now was before, very specific. Before all the grognards go crazy, because rolling stats is a big thing at some yeah, tables. Yeah, rolling stats, I think, is a big thing to talk about. First, first edition was not core roll your stats. It never was. It was a point by is the default I ability said point, point by. by. No, yeah, I know you did. I mentioned I'm saying it. First edition it was, <laughs> but it gives the option for rolling the dice in there. But and people in three, lean into that. I think that. in third and three five, rolling the die was the primary option. And That's point true. Point by was That's secondary. True. But yep. it's important to point out that se second edition does give rules for rolling it out. That's totally fine, but. I would suggest against it only because of how tight the math is. If you are under scored by any amount, uh, it could could actually be pretty detrimental to your character moving forward, right? Yep. So the yep. the buy and just is like, flavorful and balanced. Yeah, and just like point by this structure makes sure all of the characters have similar total stats. No one yes. character should be way behind. Whereas when you rolled, you could have everything from three sixteens and 18 and a couple 12s to eights and 10s and 12s. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. The 8, 10, 12 spread is a fun RP opportunity. And also uh, to be clear, in Pathfinder's first edition, that was less of a deal. Like the numbers didn't matter as much like a swing of five here and there. It, you know, it's a big deal, but it's not that big a deal. In Pathfinder Second Edition, it is, and and that might be on our list of things we'll come to. But uh, the t numbers are very tight, and rolling for stats is going to be something that a lot of people who have been playing TTRPGs for a long time really love doing and don't want to let go of. You definitely can do it, but for Pathfinder Second Edition, you're probably better served not. Which brings us to Ancestries. Tyler, you want to take Ancestries? Sure, I'll kind of take that one in the backgrounds together, if that's all right. Kind of yeah, go for along. it. Take both so, so, of course, you know, naming conventions can make a big difference. Paizo is kind of a... I really like that they're at the forefront of being progressive and the way that they're uh, set their style guides forward. Uh, race is no longer race. It's now Ancestry. Uh, and... We mentioned with the boost and the ability points, the ancestry makes a difference in what boosts you get, what flaws you get. The background that you choose does the same thing. Now, those used to be called character traits. Uh, you got, what, two of them at character yeah, creation? 
and they gave, you know, a benefit, right? Most of the time it was a circumstantial benefit for something very specific. Uh, even in some adventures, they had, like, adventure powers where you could expend it once uh, every book. book of the adventure or something like that, yeah. Um, but now you can put all of that flavor into the single background. No, there's flexibility with those backgrounds, obviously, but that's all RP. That's not rules-based. So uh, that has a mechanical play in from that um, flavor perspective. And that's what I really like. So that brings us on to small creatures. Speaking of ancestries, small creatures got really uh, screwed over in first edition and three and three, five before it, where if you wanted to make like a gnome barbarian, you were immediately at a disadvantage because you were going to, have uh, not only negatives to strength with a lot of small characters, which sometimes um, you can still find in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but also because your weapons would be dealing a lot less damage, or at least a single damage die less, which is significant when, you, uh, when you're when you building those up. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, that is not the case. All weapons for small and medium creatures deal the same damage, and less of them have negatives to strength. But again, even if they do have a negative to strength, there are ways around that where you get to take bonuses to whatever abilities you want, uh, and that can be the bonus that your character, because of their ancestry, is getting a negative to. So you can balance those things out. It's, it, you can make it work. But the bigger thing is not having that... Um, decrease in weapon damage die also you don't get the increase to ac small creatures got a plus one to their ac and like a plus one to deck saves and stuff or not uh, or bonus to stealth checks stealth checks yeah that stuff you don't get any of that and essentially mechanically small and medium creatures work very much the same with the one exception i believe being grapple stuff there is, there are still some differences in grapple where like you can only grapple a character or something that's one size category larger than you or smaller so that still does make a difference but it's much less profound difference than it used to be yeah absolutely it's definitely a, a take the goods and the bads that being small was and allow you to you know put the flavor that you want on your character without having to work around things and if it's all right with anybody, I think I'll just take the next one here because uh, it's about barbarians. It's the only totally. one I have anything for class. I want to put a whole bunch more for class stuff in here. But uh, here's a big one that I've come into playing one of the main characters I've played in the podcast, which is a barbarian. And that is rage. Rage is so much different than it used to be. Instead of giving you like plus strength and plus con, you just get a straight up extra two damage. Uh it's really only applicable if you take the Barbarian Dedication, which is the multi-class, uh, because as a full Barbarian, you'll always have more rage damage than just two. Uh, you get what's called an instinct, and the instinct changes how much rage damage you deal and gives you all sorts of other flavor options for your Barbarian. Uh, it's just a very different kind of mechanic. Uh, it does take an action to go into a rage, and you automatically go out of a rage if there are no more enemies to fight and it only lasts for a minute. So those can be uh, important things to keep track of and to know if you are playing a barbarian. So if you've got a combat that's going 10 rounds, you're done raging. Or if a, uh, an enemy like runs away, not goes invisible. You, you could still think that they're there. You would still know that they're there trying to attack you if they're invisible. But like if they run away, you may go off your guard and think, okay, they ran away. You stop raging. Or if combat's over and then another enemy jumps out, you were done. You were out of combat. No more rage. And now you're fatigued for the next fight. So it's interesting. You have less control over it than you did. And that's kind of fun because I feel like you would have less control. You don't have control over rage. That's kind of a barbarian thing. You shouldn't be in control of it. Uh I, I it's, a, it's a welcome change for me. I yeah, like agreed. it. Uh, I think it's fun. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think we could really dig into rage uh, when we talk, start talking about traits. I think rage is a great example of how to trait reference within the game. Um, and we'll talk about traits later. But the biggest thing is that, you know, of course, barbarian can't rage and do anything with the concentrate trait. Right. Right. And that, that interacts with things differently and interestingly. You couldn't do that in previous editions as well, but it wasn't so clear-cut as it is with the trait system for this. Right. 
I sorry to break the order there. I just figured the barbarian one made sense for me to talk about. Swanee, you want to take tumble through? Uh, yeah, sure. Tumble through. Uh, very different. It's the same same name, but incredibly different from one E in that. Uh, it only makes it so that you can tumble actually through somebody's square. There's no more tumbling around someone and getting out of attacks opportunity, um, anything like that. It's now just a whether you can make it through their square, and if they have a reaction, they can take that against you, even if you succeed. Yep. Um, if you fail, it automatically triggers the, the reaction. Yeah, if they that, have one. That's one of those ones that it's so easy to just assume what tumble through is based off of your experiences with first edition and three five, but it is yeah, way different. I think we were doing it wrong for a little while. Or yeah, I think so too. Well, and you know, it's interesting too because like uh you, your immediate thought is you know, for things like attack of opportunity, um, but you know, reactions are really expanded in this edition. You know, it used to be that attack of opportunity was for the most part, barring a few archetypes, I recall. Um, the only real reaction that was available in prior editions. Uh, they really expand onto that, and they have to include verbiage that brings all of those reactions into the same place for things like Tumble Through. Yeah, lots of reactions. Tyler, you want to take feats versus class feats, general feats versus class feats, and maybe skill feats? Sure. This one's big. Let's just talk about feats for a second. Yeah, we'll just talk about feats for a bit. I mean, what, we're 26 minutes in, we got, some, we got a little bit of time, let's talk about feats for a bit. Um, so, the, the feats are how you customize your character. Now, the, here's the interesting thing about feats in this edition compared to previous editions. There were, there are, there are uh, uh, going back to the trait system here, specific traits that are attached to feats. For example, there's the general feat, there is a skill feat, a class feat, and then there are ancestry feats. Now, each of those four different types of feats are given to you at different points in your character's progression. For example, you get your first ancestry feat at first level to kind of showcase how special you are as a member of your particular ancestry, and you get to you know, choose which ones you want to pick out. Uh, class feats are how you gain your power outside of just numerical increases as you level up within your class, but they are also how you multi-class uh in place of a class feat you can take what's called a dedication feat which will give you access to a uh, a tree if you will of other feats that you can take within that dedication so you can swap out class feats for those dedications or if you have a gm that likes breaking your games they can allow for the free archetype system uh which i don't think you'll ever see me do <laughs> that's another conversation though um but yeah, you just get the ability to inject some flavor with some direct power from other classes. And that can be something as, like, the multi-classes, a ranger with the fighter dedication, for example. But it also gets really specific, like a, a monk with the, acro the acrobat dedication and that sort of thing. Um, they can be very common or can be very rare and specific to even different adventure paths that Paizo releases. And then, did I cover skill feats? I don't think you talked about them. No, skill feats. Skill feats are something that everybody at least gets a few skill feats. You certainly get one with your background. A lot of times at uh, second level or third level. Some classes get more skill feats than others, like investigators or rogues. Uh, but that is how you could express your character's power through things that they're skilled at. So, uh, for example, being very knowledgeable in the arcane arts through the arcana skill, or being very good at lying through the deception skill, uh, or those types of things. Uh, Swanee has a character that really leans into the intimidate skill, um, and I know that tree is very interesting for skill feats. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in that tree. I don't want to call anybody out for anything negative, but one of our streamers is saying that they kind of feel that how everything is a feat now makes it oversimplified. And then another one of our streamers says after that, what it's like is kind of like a la carte. And I totally agree with that. It's 
instead of having everything that your character does be on that, you know, that list where it says uh, one through 20, you just have, uh, well, some of it still is, but also you just have all these choices. Here's where you choose an ancestry feat. Here's where you choose a class feat. It is kind of a la carte. And I do understand that it can seem kind of simplified, but honestly, uh, simplified or streamlined? Is it good? Is it bad? I, I think it's a nice way to do it. It does allow for a lot of customization. I think he was saying... Or is that a good thing? I think I think that his, is a good thing. I think the way he said somehow that. simplified yeah, he it. Drops, he, was, he dropped a sarcasm bomb on you, David, and you totally <laughs> yeah, went over he, your head. He, just boom. There we go. I, <laughs> that's, you know what? It's fine. That's that's interesting coming from the pun guy. You're taking yourself really seriously right now, David. <laughs> Sorry. It's, uh, I'll try and loosen up because clearly, <laughs> clearly I've with, got a stick up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> he says with a glass of booze in his hand. <laughs> Oh man. Well, what do you think, David, about the the class feed system? I know you mentioned about the multi classing. We yeah, haven't maybe dove like, into that a ton. Yeah, let's well, maybe maybe have. now is a good time to talk just a little bit about how multi classing works. So uh instead of so once you pick your first character, and again, this is one of the more general things uh that it's that's easy to know the differences because it's a core mechanical thing. It's not just like a little finicky thing. But when you pick a class at level one, that is your class. That does not change. What you can do is as a class feat is you can take a dedication, which is essentially multi-classing. And what that does is it gives you access to some of the class feats of a different class, as well as a few just little um, extra bonuses. They're pretty minor most of the time um, when you first take that dedication feat. And that's how multi-classing works. It's, it's nice. It's simple. Um, so you're just taking a little bit away from your primary class with those class feats and spending them on a secondary class feat. And you can do as much or as little of that as you want. A yep. really simple example. Moonlight, second level. Didn't really care for most of the feats that a second level caster could get. I was looking at everything and went, you know, I want to go rogue. Rogue gave me some, uh, gave me the ability to wear some armor, gave me uh, stealth and thievery, which were two things that I wanted, but because sorcerers don't get very many skills and my intelligence wasn't high enough to get any additional skills, this was a way, rogue is a great one for getting some small things that kind of add up and become really good things. But they do tend to be a little less splashy when you take that first dedication. Yeah, except yeah. for Alchemist. Alchemist dedication is broken. You get so much good shit with Alchemist dedication. It's a fantastic <laughs> dedication. So yeah, if you want to break your character, uh, get Alchemist dedication. It could be argued that the fighter dedication is, uh, fighter dedication is also is good. A, a dip that anybody Make could take and be uh, happy with. For your ancestry, pick Ancient Elf. Ancient Elf allows you to take one free... Uh, dedication feat at level one. So at Def level one, you can yeah. be two classes. It's fantastic. It is pretty cool. And, and, and it, you know, we talk, we talk about all of the different options and the, the a la carte style of the way that it plays is really uh, a way that you can make a lot of different types of characters. It's more about your flavor as opposed to the, you know, the mechanics are there to bolster the flavor that you're looking to inject into the character. Uh, as opposed to being the thing that you derive flavor from. I remember looking through first edition and looking at feats and being like, ooh, this is a cool feat. I'm going to build my character concept off of this. But don't get me wrong, I like that. But then that focuses the the beginnings of a character on the mechanics as opposed to the story that you want to put behind it. Well, uh, we can move on since I kind of stole a few swanny you want to take carry capacity yeah carry capacity they really simplified this instead of having a weight to everything it's broken down into three sections you either have light bulk which it takes 10 of those items become one full bulk and you need a full 10 before you become a bulk otherwise i mean if you have less than 10 it doesn't count as anything mm -hmm. uh you got is it just, um, oh, you've got no or negligible bulk, which is really the first one, where it just, it weighs nothing. A ring doesn't add anything to you. A potion is light, you know, there's a little bit of weight to it. It's got a little bit of size to it. And then uh, you just have one, then you have things that are a bulk or two bulk. Um, some weapons are two bulk. Some, uh, some weapons are one bulk. Armor is two bulk, depending on the armor. And then uh, 
the way it kind of you figure your encumbrance is base your base is five plus strength mod and your max is ten plus strength mod. There are feats and stuff that can alter those, but those are your base. I uh I liked I like the bulk. Uh part of me, the cynic in me is like, oh look, you know, a simpler system for me to totally ignore during, you know, <laughs> like after three months of play. Like I, we're really gonna get tracking this this time, guys, and and to get a couple of months in, you're like, how much are you carrying again? Cry minute, you should be encumbered. <laughs> As somebody who will play a ranger and literally meticulously create a list of 30 items my person is carrying and have every single weight and every little thing and like all that stuff to try and figure I mean, I kind of, it was kind of game within a game. It was fun, but uh, it is so much simpler. And honestly, it makes so much more sense now. I mean, is it ever going to be realistic? I was talking about how I like the realism of, of spears and stuff. Is it ever going to be realistic how much your adventurer can carry? No, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen unless you just give every character a portable hole at the beginning of the adventure. It's just, it's completely unrealistic. At least this is a much simpler unrealistic. <laughs> There's no and way you, your and you talk about ignoring is that it. efficient. I find I don't ignore my bulk now. No, I mean, any of my characters. I definitely keep track of how much I have and that I'm not going over. I mean, but I mean, even Moonlight, who doesn't have much strength, they're casters, so they really don't carry much either. Yep. That's true. That's true. And uh, I suppose what I mean to say is that if you're going to ignore it, you're going to keep ignoring it. Right. Right. But I I think a lot of groups do ignore it. And I think a lot of GMs ignore it. I mean, like as a as a GM, when I'm GM, I'm not looking at people's bulk. I'm just trusting that you've got it figured out. And if and if you're cheating and carrying more than you should, good job. Well, well done. You've won. You got one over tabletop RPGs. You cheated. Like, congratulations. (laughs) That's one of my favorite things is, yeah, if you're cheating in a tabletop RPG, um, I guess go ahead. You need to feel better about yourself anyways. (laughs) (laughs) It's fine, I guess. (laughs) Oh, man. Tyler, you want to take the next one? Shields? Oh, man, Shields, I love this one. So this plays in really tightly with the new action economy, right? It used to be that when you were wearing a shield, you didn't have to put any additional effort into gaining the bonus from that shield. And this is a sticking point with a lot of uh, players who are used to just getting that shield bonus from previous editions. But you don't get that bonus until you spend the action to raise that shield and use it defensively. Um, Now... That sounds underwhelming, you know, the action economy to those of us who know in all editions of tabletop games when it comes to your rate of success is one of the most important things, right? The action economy, if you can manipulate it in some way, will almost always bring you out on top, right? Uh, But the bonus that you get from it goes farther because every plus one plus two means so much more (coughs) in the chassis of the system. Uh, because of both the crit system and just how tight the math is in general. Um, but you also get the cool things like the uh, shield block reaction. There's a lot of talk about how the shield block reaction is kind of clunky because of the way the broken threshold works. I don't disagree with that, right? Uh, That's more on is- shields themselves than... One thing the, the, the action. One thing this yeah. group has never gotten into very much are are like more durable shields. They are not expensive and they're they're easy to get. We haven't dealt with them too much, but uh, I have looked into Who uses it. Uses shields. <laughs> I, I like characters that use shields. <laughs> I wanted to make a character that used shields and on a reach spear because I really wanted to get my immersion and realism up because that's really what they all did. Uh, but you can't do that. There's no, there's no reach weapon you can wield one. You, you Except for a whip. To be a Spartan, huh? Yeah, exactly. Or a exactly. Roman. Or, or literally every foot soldier since like <laughs> 1200. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're not wrong about that. Uh, I tried that myself and ended up landing on a uh, dedication that gave me the shield cantrip. So I could still just get yeah. the shield, but still wield but yeah, two hands. But you can get shields that have a lot more damage uh, on them than yeah. uh, than just a basic one and the quite shield specifically cantrip. the sturdy shield yeah the sturdy shield as, that's what it's called i couldn't quite remember pickles pointing out yeah absolutely and then the yeah. shield cantrip scales up and gets more durable as you go i just like i i just like the way that it plays in that that you know your shield is meaningful in combat by design 
it's not just something that you slap on and forget about because it's your AC bonus all the time. It's an interactive part of the game and of your combat situation. Yeah. Totally. And, and I do think that they really thought about it with, again, the balancing. You have three actions. It takes one action to do that. Exactly. So you still have two actions. Which is enough to move so, and strike. Yep, move, strike, raise shield, or strike, strike, raise shield. Instead of striking a third time at a minus 10, raise that shield, get a plus 2 AC. It makes a difference. Yep. People, a lot of people complain about, oh, what do you do with your third action when you're a melee person? It's not just swing wildly. <laughs> I, I, it, I mean, can it can be. be. It can be. <laughs> at some points, that's what you need. But you know, we call it crit you know. fishing at our table. Like yep. you are on your third attack. If you're making that third attack at the minus ten, you're just looking to get a twenty on the die. Like, yeah. and that that's yeah. an effect. That's a strategy, right? It's, but it's, it's a strategy. But you know, learn some intimidate or get a shield. There's so many things you can do with that third action. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A, a, a just a really quick a, a friend of the podcast posted on their Facebook. I won't say because because we're, we're Facebook friends, but uh, and it was a picture of their breakfast and they had cooked a, an egg and somehow this egg had perfectly had two eyeballs and a frowny face and it was like the <laughs> most perfect face that you could possibly have on an egg. And and my comment on their post was, "This is what it feels like when you roll a nat twenty, but it's still too low and you don't get the crit." Like, it's, it feels good because it's so perfect, but then it's very sad. Anyway. I like that. I like that. <laughs> finesse. Weapon yeah. finesse is no longer a feat. It doesn't exist the way it used to, where you'd have to, like, have the feat uh, finesse and then choose a weapon to be finesse. Uh, instead, all weapons that can be used with dex to attack have the finesse trait as uh, as one of the traits on the weapons kind of like reach is uh, a trait finesse is a trait so you don't have to have anything special anybody can use dex to attack as long as you're using a weapon that has the finesse trait kind of a simple one but one that can sometimes be easy to overlook you're like oh, how do i figure out you know how do i get weapon finesse i want weapon finesse no nope, you just have it you just pick that weapon yep and that gives you your dex to attack not to damage. There's Not to only, damage. As far, so far, there is only one way to get dex to damage, and that's to be a specific type of rogue. So that's still yep. very difficult, but uh, rewarding if you choose to go that path. It absolutely yep. can. But be. you have to give some other stuff up to get that. Yeah, you do. So then, uh, learning from a scroll. Uh, Swanee, you want to take that one? Um, I'm going to keep this pretty generic. I don't really know the learning from scrolls, like the actual rules on how to do it. But one of the big things that is different from 1E, which is the whole point of this, is that in 1E it always called out when you learned a spell from a scroll, that scroll was expended. 2E does not have that verbiage anywhere. As best we, we can tell. everywhere. We looked everywhere. We looked at yeah. traits. We looked at every like word in there and we couldn't find anything that said it used the scroll anymore yeah and the same yeah. is true for alchemist formulas and uh really quick the the check that you have to make is you just have to make the dc craft value uh for that for that um for that scroll which is a um which is a dc by level which is also on this list we'll get to it <laughs> that's for the gms yeah God, i love that it's it's Anyways. huge it's a huge difference uh oh god <laughs> fucking death and dying tyler <laughs> who, who wants to take this one oh, I, think, damn, I think it's tyler i love this goddamn strap in for this one it says in the in the excel sheet <laughs> okay um okay so death and dying is vastly different than it used to be uh you know it got to the point with the way that death and dying was is we were pretty sure that we were doing it correct the first time we approached it in Fall of Plague Stone, we discovered that we were doing it wrong. Then we corrected it. Then it got eroded to the way that we were originally doing it. It's been a mess, right? Uh, but well, it said it two different ways in the core. Yes, that was the, the core problem. said in one spot that you came back to consciousness, and in another spot. Well, that's that's for using action points to 
bring yourself back up, right but. the hero point section yeah uh but but the way that it works in previous editions is your zero wasn't dead and it wasn't it was unconscious right if you were at zero hit points in any previous edition of you know dungeon and dragons pathfinder uh you were disabled which means you could either move or do a standard action and zero then you or lose. below because zero in, or in below. pathfinder you, you know you can go negative yeah, so then the negative in the old editions, it was once you go negative, whatever your charisma modifier was, then con, you con, finally con died. Score, con score. Con score. Con that's, score yep, that's right. Uh, no longer is that the case. Now it's the dying condition. Now, when you hit zero hit points, you go to dying one. But how you hit zero hit points <laughs> makes a difference. If you hit zero because you critically failed a save of some kind or you got critically hit by an attack of some kind, you immediately go to dying two. And just to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, you know, a attend to their dying companion, your initiative spot moves to right above the person or thing that knocked you unconscious. So say that again, everybody... Tyler. Say that again. What? Say, just say that again. That's a huge the... deal that I think a lot of people miss. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you change your order in initiative to the th above the thing that made you go to dying. Whether that be a hazard, which has an initiative in second edition, or a creature, uh, I don't think we've come across the "I fell on my own turn and died," but we'll uh, we get into have we did recently, we have we? actually. Yeah. Oh, really? I don't think it's I don't think it's aired yet, but. Oh, okay, I got you. So we'll we'll leave that alone <laughs> for <laughs> now. Uh, but no, it's it's one of those things where uh, once you get your your head wrapped around at an initiative thing the dying rules aren't quite as bad as they really seem at first um but yeah, one of those you... big things is that when you become wounded you don't get a wounded value equal to your dying value that right. is its own separate track starting at one which Correct. was what we were doing wrong initially at one point also yeah so when yes. you come back alive through whatever means generally going to be some kind of healing from your dying value, let's say you're dying one, you would come back as wounded one. So that way, if you get knocked down again, you don't go to dying one, you go to dying two. But then if you uh, uh, say you got knocked down with a crit, and so you were dying two to begin with, when you come back up, you're still only wounded one. That doesn't add to it. It's just each subsequent time, no matter what you got to, that's when the wounded value gets raised. Just makes yes. it easier to die when you get knocked over again. Correct. It makes it so that if you are repeatedly being knocked down, it's going to be that much easier to actually kill you. Yes. Yep. You don't get that popcorn effect that you get with, like, I know fifth fifth edition people say that, that you could just popcorn up all, all right, day exactly. during combat. Yeah, yeah, you cannot do that. No. It makes that uh, orc ferocity, which, uh, which makes it so you don't go unconscious when you hit zero for a, rev for a round is really good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Discord saying is popping off if you will saying popcorn is awful and it is it <laughs> ruins my immersions <laughs> and ben this is probably say. getting a little more detailed but on the opposite side of wounded you have doomed which reduces how much how high your do your dying value can go now so doomed, doomed one you have to reduce your max dying value that you can go before dying yeah. which is typically yep. four so when you hit dying four, four that's you when you're dead three yep so then you'd be dead at three now there's ways to increase that like a uh, die hard lets you go up to five and there's other things that let you go up even further so yeah absolutely it is complicated that is that is the main thing dying is complicated but once you're in it like tyler said and using it it actually starts to flow. Then it, it, once you see it and you're using it, it's like, oh, okay, this makes sense. And it's good. Like, I think it, I think it works well. I think one thing that uh, when you hear about it for the first time, or maybe even when you're reading about it for the first time, yeah, the popcorn thing is not what is something that happens. Eventually you, you don't get back up. Uh, but you really don't have to get up three times in order to be a danger of dying either. The introduction no. of the way persistent damage works, uh, the absolute viability of poisons, etc. cetera, uh, you know, all the way one, level one to level 20, death can happen very quickly if things go wrong. <laughs> well, uh, I think you should take level-based DCs, Tyler. So I'll take uh, initiative real quick. 
initiative is a uh, different kind of animal than it was in previous editions where it was always just like um, you'd add your decks to it and then you maybe had the incredible or improved initiative feat. And there are a few other little things that you can use to get your initiative up there. Uh, it's very different now uh, in that it is generally going to be a perception check. So it's actually your wisdom that is going to in general, be going to your uh, initiative rather than your dexterity. However, you can finagle that because in theory, you can use any skill to roll initiative. If you can provide an adequate reason to your game master, then you can use it. Are you a rogue and you're trying to be quiet? Stealth, there's your dex. That's a great way to use dex to initiative. You'd roll your stealth check for initiative. Um, If you're moonlight and trying to make it so that they don't even fight you, you roll intimidate. Yeah, you can roll yeah. intimidate as your <laughs> yep, initiative. Yep. There's charisma. Uh, if you are trying to craft an item and uh, the item is trying to fight back, roll your craft check as uh, <laughs> as an I don't that's know. Great, that's great for craft. Little. It could happen. It could like happen. That. This is like this that. is fantasy world. Anything could happen. But yeah, Absolutely. so initiative initiative is interesting. It can go in a lot of different directions. And, you know, because of the way that that works, and, and I, I, I do really love it, it, it rewards players for creatively approaching combat with what they're good at, yeah. right? Uh, it's fantastic, and it's built right into the system. It's very nice. Yeah. All right, hmm. level-based DCs, Tyler. Hit yeah, we, let's do it. We, we've got so, a few minutes left. We can do this. Oh, we do. Oh, wow. That, that hour went quick. Because we've right, still so, got our most important section coming up. We do. <laughs> Stay tuned. So, it's coming. It's coming. So level-based DCs is the thing, and and this is not immediately obvious on the surface when you're reading the core rule book, but second edition was a game that was designed to give GMs the tools that they need to make a appropriate account encounter with solid, strict math and difficulty scaling. The level-based DC system is a very simple table. Uh, it's levels you know, one through 20, the DC for each of those levels, as it being a level appropriate encounter or, uh, you know, challenge to overcome. And then there are level spell level DCs. So like a first level spell DC is this, a second level spell DC is this, which is more along the lines of, uh, hmm, for counteract checks, I think than anything else. Right. Uh, but it really gives people the chance to homebrew quickly and if I've got a uh, post-it note just on my monitor during pl- during play night, and when these guys want to do something that either isn't covered in the adventure path or was totally out of left field, it happens pretty often. I could just toss a level DC on them based on what level they're at at the time. And a so. lot of things are level-based DCs. A lot yes. of things, and I, we don't even need to bother going into any of it. But if if it doesn't say, or if it's kind of ambiguous, it's a level-based DC, mm-hmm. and it's very simple. All right, Swanee, you want to take drawing while moving real quick before we move on to the final segment? Yeah, this one's real quick. Uh, you can't do it. You can't draw a weapon <laughs> as part of the move action anymore. That we've, we have questioned that so many times and double-checked that so many times. And I think it goes back to, again, the three-action system. You have another action to do these things that they kind of let you do before because you had so much less options with just the two actions, which is the, I mean, the, it's even more strict than two actions. You had a move and a standard. Yep. Yep. And, and real quick, and I know that's the last, you know, item, but this is a totally random thing that I came across when I was, uh, thinking about it. I knew this, but it, it didn't occur to me that it was such a knee jerk reaction. When you get the stunned condition in second edition, you do not drop all of your items. Yeah. You don't. That's you still one. hold them. There's uh, so many of these. There's so many of these. I was looking for that the other night. I'm like, God, I swore it was in there. It's not. It's not? No. Nope. It says Definitely. nothing about dropping your items. All right. Okay. I, we could keep going on, and, and, may, and we, I'm sure we will. I, sh- I, I think we could continue to do this. It could be a segment in future episodes. But now it is time for the most important segment. In the court of Minmaxed. There are not two separate and equal systems. There's only one, and it's the rules lawyer, Swanee. Today, Tyler and I are stepping into Swanee's Rules Court. 
I will be presenting one side of the argument and Tyler the other. Today, the argument is, can you sustain a spell on the same turn in which you cast it? And I say nay, sir, you cannot. I don't understand why you are pushing this point because if you look in the sustain a spell action, it has no prerequisites that a round needs to have passed in order for you to sustain a spell with your third action after casting it with your first two. But how can you sustain a spell that you've just cast on that turn? It doesn't make sense. Okay, does the rules specifically say no? It's like the rules intended versus like rules as written sort of thing. Like, why would you be sustaining a spell on the same action in which I, we're not going to be able to just bring in the judge? Uh, all right, fine, fine. Swanee, you have to settle this for us because it's just one of those things that it feels like you shouldn't be able to do it because you know time has passed you are sustaining the spell that you cast in the past but there are spells that have the immediate benefit of sustaining bless for example increases by five feet when you sustain it it's not even a sustained spell you just get the option to do it bless it up your ass ah oh, bane it up yours <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I can't, I can't the laugh anymore. <laughs> technically, <laughs> hold on. Technically, bless and bane do not use the sustain action for that. So sorry, that is an invalid argument. Damn it. I thought <laughs> I had good presentation <laughs> there. Alright, alright, alright. Fine, fine. If that's the case, I'm gonna go directly into the sustain a spell action. It is very clear in the rules under the sustain a spell, it is a special activity, one action with the concentrate trait, and the only requirements are that you have to have at least one spell active with the sustained duration, and you are not fatigued. Well, Hmm. Fatigue does happen if you uh, sustain for more than 10 minutes, so... Ah, okay, all right. However, I posit that that doesn't matter in the argument because this is all taking place in the same turn. I concede, I okay. concede that it is taking place in one round. You probably wouldn't be fatigued. Unless you're a barbarian who just ran out of enemies to kill. <laughs> it happens, all right? It does. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't know how else I can make it more plain than the sustain a spell activity. Rules is written versus rules is intended. So I'm sticking with. All right, fine. Swanee, can you, can you rule on this one for us? Well, as we do not know what the rules intended is, we must stick with the rules as written. And I thereby say that sustain a spell, sustain a sp spell can be done in the same turn that it is cast unless the spell says otherwise court is adjourned boom <laughs> fine fine <laughs> oh that was way more fun than it had any right to be <laughs> as was this entire thing and of course i want to thank you guys my friends swanee tyler for doing this i think it's really fun and everybody who is in our stream listening and following mm -hmm. along and anybody who comes and finds this video afterwards so now tyler will you please explain what this video format will be like moving forward so you guys just saw what we're going to be calling uh min max masters and it's uh david what was it again you've got this down uh, yeah i've me. got it written down I, I wrote it and i don't remember monthly <laughs> awesome session to eviscerate rules shit so the whole idea behind this is that there are a lot of fun rules interactions and little things that you just don't think of when you're reading through the rules in the system and how they interact during play, whether it's combat, exploration mode, or what have you. So this will be a segment which we will be focusing solely on rules as they're written, uh, and it will be something that will be a benefit for anybody at any tier of our patron page. And we'll be releasing the, this first step one on YouTube. So, hey, YouTube people out there, if you're there, <laughs> how do hey. I do this? Uh, smash the like button. Subscribe. No, I'm done. I can't do it. So, <laughs> hey, son, I'm on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. So it, it's it's uh, it's something that we want to give back to people. And I feel like we've got a table of people who we really not only do we 
rely on the rules to educate our game, but we all lean really into it. And uh, we wanted to share how we had these rules discussions around the table, which frequently get cut. We'll give you the conclusion of the rules lookup, but we won't give you the, you know, meandering that it took to referencing this I trait. I promise you it's boring. This. You don't want that. <laughs> well, we're focusing on yourself. it here. <laughs> yeah, right. So well, this is where people can it. come to get it. We're going to do yes. it here. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we really uh, love the support that you guys provide for us. This is something that we just we have to do to give back to you guys. Obviously, it's a benefit that we want to give to our patrons. But, you know, to help, you know, give us the means to give you more content. And with that in mind, we've got a patron goal that we are how many dollars away from Swanee? Eighty. Uh, we are to 80. Yep. We got We're a new ten dollar person today. So we're going to be announcing very shortly, if we that, that uh, $80 gap gets closed, the new second edition podcast adventure that we're going to be playing, uh, and as well as all the information behind it. So are you going to give any spoilers? Are you going to give maybe just a little spoiler? A little God, spoiler? These guys, these guys are good, man. Every give time I give, give, give even a just a spoiler. Little, I'd say give them a little, little spoiler. Itty bitty. Let them know what's... Yeah, let him know. Okay. Not, not, not right. the whole thing. Don't give away the whole biscuit. Just a I little bit. I won't. I won't. Just gonna give a little bit. Uh, so this is a little. This is a little one. Uh, it is something that I am doing all of the work to convert from a first edition adventure to a second edition. Oh, what's that? We're gonna be playing a converted first edition in AP. Yep. Oh. That's the spoiler. So Big news. talk amongst Big yourselves news. on what it might be for the Big listeners. News. But yeah. Well. Speaking of the listeners, we want to thank all of you for joining us here in this stream. And if you found this video on YouTube, thank you for watching. Uh, as we end every episode, I just want to say, I hope all of you have many great adventures of your own. It's your turn. <laughs>